to all those above me that watch over me, to all of you, my fave para-peeps on this side of the veil, welcome. This is the Paranormal Ministry. I'm your host, Sean Whittington. I'm a seminarian in the United States Old Catholic Church, and I'm coming to you live from my haunted home, my very haunted home, where I live. If there's anything you want to know about my wife and I and our ministry work, go to our website, www.ghost-b-gone.biz. It's all there. But tonight, you've all been patiently waiting for tonight, and no one's more excited than me. Tonight begins the Joy to the World monthly lecture series, second Monday of every month with my very special co-host who's in the green room. So without further ado, I'm going to bring her out. Please, everyone, give a warm Paranormal Ministry family welcome to the one and only, the good reverend herself, Dr. Joy Pugh. Hi, Sean. This is so exciting to be your (laughs) guest. I am looking so forward to this series. It's it's always fun to be able to do like a monthly show because you can kind of build on information. So when you ask me to do this with you, I've been excited all day. I have just been so tickled because I know that there's a lot of people that don't understand about a lot of the subjects that I talk about. And this will give me the chance to kind of go in a little bit more detail. And if we don't get through, you know, in an hour's time, I don't have to worry. I can pick up with it the next time we're together. So this this will be fascinating. It will be fascinating to be able to teach people about something that I feel so I, I mean, I just have such a, a love for what I do. And so teaching about the things that I've researched in such detail will be it will be great. And I thank you for letting me do this. My pleasure. You know, I love you and respect you. And it's always it's a pleasure. I just hope you don't get sick of seeing me every month. I won't. Um, I, won't. <laughs> I promise listen, I won't. I you know me when you're on, I bring I bring something cool to drink, sometimes hot. But I'm uh, I know to just, I'm just going to be quiet. I'm looking forward to being a student tonight and listening to what you have to talk about. Tonight's subject is, I love this tonight's subject. So I'm all yours and my audience is all yours whenever you're ready. (laughs) Okay. Thank you so much again. This is, this is really a a thrill for me. And when I was thinking about what I really wanted to do uh, this first show with to really get our, I guess our uh, monthly show kind of off the ground, I really did a lot of praying about it and really trying to decide what what was the topic that really had given me inspiration. And there was no doubt in my mind what that was, because like I have mentioned on your show uh, many times when I've been on that I had a strange dream when I was six years old that I actually saw what I believe was the end of days. But the most fascinating thing as part of that was that I saw Jesus. So I have in my mind a picture still from that that vision that I had as a young child as to what he looked like. And so I was fascinated by that. And because I knew that I would feel like I would see the end of days from the time I was six years old, I began doing a little bit of research on and on, drove my Sunday school teachers mad by the, <laughs> the questions that I would answer and ask. And so they really, really gave me inspiration to keep trying to find the answers. Many times he would say, well, just don't worry about it. It's just symbolism in biblical scripture. But I quickly began to see that it was all the truth and it was not going to be symbols. It was going to be the reality of what we're seeing today. So as I went through school, I was trying to find the answers to these questions and asking a lot of questions and, and really starting to do a lot of reading. And by the time I was 12 and 13, I began reading Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And then I really started delving into the book of Revelation, which most people said, oh, don't even go there. Don't even try to look at that and understand it. But I was fascinated by it. I could not put it down. The more that I would read it, the more I wanted to read it, the more I wanted to dig deeper into it. So because I really believed that I had seen Jesus and that the end of days would happen in my lifetime, I really set out to find the answers to the questions about how it would come to pass and how somebody at the latter days could come into a generation of people that should be very intelligent about uh, the Christian religion 
and that the days would have to be cut short because even the elect could be fooled by this particular man. So this is what really, really started everything for me. And I'm so tickled to show this tonight because I've talked about it before on your show. And um, I had a good friend hear me talk about how important this was to me. When I had started to college, my dad brought home a magazine that showed the Shroud of Turin, which is the Holy Shroud that covered Jesus Christ after he was taken down from the cross of Calvary and put into the tomb. And when he walked in with the book, he had it open. I remember it. I could just see myself. I was, I was, it was actually uh, in September, right before I was starting to college uh, to work on my junior <laughs> level in college. And I remember him saying, he always called me girl. He said, girl, I've got something I want to show you. And when he did, he opened up this magazine and he turned it around and he said, you ever seen anything like this before? It's the Shroud of Turin. And immediately upon gazing at this, I was like, I have seen this man. And so I took it from his hands and I remember reading it and looking at the picture and just going, oh my gosh, you know, I've tried to tell people about this. I've tried to explain little things about what I've seen, but nobody seemed to really get it. And having that magazine was just phenomenal. So I had mentioned it on your show. And like I say, I had someone that's very special to me hear that. And so one day he asked me, he said, tell me more about this magazine that your dad brought home. And so I began telling him that I felt like it was in the fall and that I knew that it was probably in the year of 1978 and it had something to do with the Shroud of Turin. But if I ever saw that magazine or that fold out of what he gave to me, I would know that it was the right one. So he began a just a major search across internet, everything, trying to find this particular magazine. And I knew that in our home, we had usually three magazines that daddy would get. And one of those was Newsweek. Well, sure enough, guess what he found for me? <laughs> yes, and I, well, I tell you, when he gave this to me, Sean, I sat down, I had chill bumps all wow. over. I had, because I, I was like, Tears were running out of my eyes. I could not have been more thankful. Never dreaming, never dreaming in my wildest dreams that I'd be able to hold this in my hands again. But he, he was able to find me three. He didn't stop with one copy. He got me three copies. So I have three copies of this particular magazine. So it was a Newsweek magazine. And this was the um, actual the headlines was a summit. And of course, it had Jimmy Carter on there, who is was governor and president uh, in the United States, who's governor of Georgia. So I, I knew about him as a young girl growing up. So it was pretty uh, impressive because it's got, uh, you know, when they were having the summit for peace. So anyway, on page 94 of this magazine, it was considered a, a, an area was about religion. And I'm going to open that up so you can see what my dad actually handed to me that day. And the moment, a moment when I opened this up and saw this, tears just ran down my face. This just, it still gives me chill months to think about what this meant to me. But anyway, this is the only thing I get it right in the middle of the thing. This is the first part of that article. And if you will see, there is a picture, let me go this way, of, of the shroud. Let me see if I can turn it. This is, uh, let me find where it's at. Okay. The picture of the shroud that I will never forget laying my eyes on because you can clearly see oh, yeah. that it is a man and what he looks like. I mean, it's quite evident what he looks like. And so I was blown away by that. And then on the other page, it shows you what it looks like in the face feature. If I can get it right there where you can see the face itself. Yeah. And this of course, on the other side is the linen cloth as it appears, because this is all done with uh, negatives. That was the interesting thing. When they took the picture in negative, you were able to see the image much greater. But this image over here, 
is actually what the cloth looks like, um, you know, when it's, it's, it's hanging up there in, in, in uh, Turin. But the negative image, I mean, it's just amazing to me what yeah. the negative looked like because it was just so real. So this two page, this two page article right here in Newsweek was what my dad handed to me. And I will just never forget. I, mean, I, I knew that if I ever saw that again, I would know it. I mean, it was just like, oh, my gosh. But for him to find me three of these magazines and these Newsweek. And this one came out of, I think, Connecticut is where this person has still had this. And I mean, it's in pristine condition. Yeah. Oh, How old copies. is that magazine? When was that originally well, published? It was September the 18th, 1978, just like I had told him in the fall of 1978. And would you believe it cost a dollar? Wow. This huge magazine cost a dollar. And Jimmy Carter, he's still alive, I believe, isn't he? Yes, he is. And he lives not too, far, not too far from where I live. About, and he does um, a lot of charity work, too. He's very stupid. At his age, he's very active. Oh, yes. He, he's very active. And uh, he still lives about an hour and a half from where I live. And so, oh, um, you know, I grew up knowing about him and being the peanut farmer that he was. My father was a <laughs> farmer. So, you yeah. know, everybody wanted him to be the governor of Georgia because he had that experience in farming. And people really kind of trusted him about all that. But, yeah. you know, the thing about it is, Having seen this article and having had the dream that I had and having asked a million questions to all my, you know, teachers and different kinds of people about the end of days and what Jesus looked like. And you'd have people say, well, there's no way we would know what Jesus looked like. And I'm thinking, well, how is it at the end of days that Jesus has said somebody's going to come looking and acting like I am? And I'm thinking, hmm. How would we know what you kind of look like? So some of the research that I did do for my book, Eden, the Knowledge of Good and Evil 666, was in regard to what he looks like. And I think a lot of people have tried to make him into the Kazarian look. And if you'll look at that image, it is not Kazarian. It's not a hook nosed person. It is not like we see many times on the History Channel with the curly, kinky kind of hair. That is not what he looks like. And I need that. From the you know from the vision or the dream that I had when I was six years old, that he looked more like a Sephardic Jew, which has the more of the long hair and it's natural coming down with the natural beard, crystal blue eyes. I mean that was the one thing that he had crystal blue eyes. They were not brown. They were not like dark colored. They were absolutely colored. So when you look at the shroud, you see the hair difference. It's not like the Kazarian Jew. It has no image like that. So some of the things that we've seen in the past, when you would see like the robe and some of the other old, um, I guess, Hollywood uh, depictions of Jesus, you would see the hair being more normal and, and flowing like this, uh, this shroud is. Yeah. And only until our reach, recent time have they tried to push it in to make him look you know, dark skin and black hair and, and the hook nose. And that's just not what the shroud shows. And so the iconic paintings and everything that were done of Jesus that still are in the monastery at the uh, bottom of the uh, Mount Sinai, it clearly shows him looking like this. I mean, the, the paintings are done like this. Even the uh, uh, Justinian coins that were that were actually embossed over a period of time during uh, in the reign after uh, the monastery was there, they also show the same kind of Jesus that's on uh, the shroud. So I think that we can, you know, from the history and what we're going to be talking about is that we're going to see that the way the paintings first started out were correct. And some of this new uh, push to make it look like a different kind of Jesus that you need to be aware of that the first paintings, the iconic paintings and the things that were first done in Hollywood clearly showed what Jesus I know looks like. So that is why this, this book or this magazine was so important to me. And I, and I, it's a special gift. It will, it will always have a very special place in my home because it really was the start of me understanding about how important this shroud of Turin is. And I clearly what believe. You, what did you think about the Jesus making a Super Bowl appearance? The what? Did you catch that? They had uh, at least I saw one. I heard there were three commercials about Jesus during the Super Bowl. You know, I had to do a radio show live last night, and the only thing that I was able to actually watch was actually the um, um, 
the thing with Rihanna because I wanted to see if that was going to follow in suit the same thing as what had happened at the Grammys. And clearly yeah. it was the same thing of um, lifting up Satan, and, you know, making him what he was. So I didn't get to see the commercials because I got home from church. Yeah, about pretty, pretty wonderful. You, after the show tonight, uh, you should Google it. Um, uh, yeah, somebody it, had mentioned really, to me really that, moving, really moving. Well done, well done commercial. That, that they were going to do that, but I did, I did not get to see anything like that. The main thing is the halftime shows have always been something that was I feel like was set up for new age, just like the Grammys have become, just like the opening ceremonies and the closing ceremonies of the Olympics. And I've been doing research on on the symbolism of what they do and how they present it in an artistic manner that is subliminally actually kind of coding us to accept Satan. So that was one of the reasons that I was trying to watch that. But then I had to go on the monthly show that I do with John Baptist is every Sunday night uh, from nine to ten. And so it just happened to fall that it was on the uh, Super Bowl. And so I only got the chance to try to get in to, to do the research for that show last night. It's, yeah, it's don't feel amazing. bad. I only got to see a little bit of the first half, and then I was in Bible study the rest of the game. So Yes. <laughs> so, you know, talking about the Shroud of Turin and how important this is, I really kind of want to go through a little bit about it. And um, to really make you understand, and the people that that typically have said, oh, that couldn't be the burial cloth of, of Jesus. I'm going to, I want to be able to prove to you that it it is. And sure. I truly believe that the Catholic Church and the Pope truly believe it's real. It is one of the most research. It, in fact, it is the most research relic in all of human history. And nobody has been able at any time, even with huge amounts of money being offered to people to reproduce that image. No one with the technology that we have today has been able to successively produce that image as it stands on that shroud. And so uh, I, I think that it's very important to understand that some people say, well, why would Jesus leave that? Because I think he wants us to know what he looks like, that he's real, that he resurrected through that cloth. It's proof that he's alive again. And it gives us as Christians the knowledge and the hope that he is going to return just like he said he he, he was going to do. And I think the fact that it is such a miraculous cloth that the things that are on it prove exactly what the Bible has told us happened to him here Absolutely. and how horrific that was. So I wanted to kind of just give to like bits and pieces of information to kind of get us started. So it may seem like a little bit of a history lesson. Do you mind if I ask you a quick question? Just to, it's a, sure. for your opinion on this. Sure. If I remember correctly, they haven't even displayed it at the Vatican or in, in uh, Turin since uh, like 2015. And they used to have it in like an airtight uh, chamber with like bulletproof glass. Mm -hmm. And that was like 2015. And they stopped letting people come. Uh, people would love to come and like pray in front of it. Like uh, right. in the Catholic religion, we have... Um, um, you know, you can, some churches display Christ all the time and you can go in there and be with them. Um, adoration, they call it. Um, sure. And it was very much like that. And I wondered why they had stopped that. Well, you know, uh, Barry Swartz, who did a lot of the uh, photography on the, the image, had made a comment because I had wondered the same thing, why they were kind of keeping it less likely to go in and let people do that. And they had changed and actually increase the kind of security on it, as well as putting it in another type of uh, gas enclosed structure that is supposed to preserve it even, let's say, greater. But one of the things that he noted, because he was, uh, I guess, a member of one of the first STERC committee, which was the research committees that went in and actually were scientists who uh, took samples and did photographs and whatever, and he actually photographed it. That he, I think he went back during that time, if I'm not mistaken. And he made the comment that the, the cloth looked gray looking to him, that the stains did not look quite as um, prevalent. And, and and I think there were a lot of people who saw it during that time and wondered if what they were seeing was actually a holographic image 
of it and not the real cloth itself. Hmm. And I, I found it fascinating that they've just come out with a movie that one of my Facebook friends called me and said, Dr. Joy, do you know about a movie that <laughs> took what you say about the cloth in regard to cloning? And they've come out with a movie about that. And it, it was called The Devil Conspiracy. And it was something I would have never even thought about going to see. But it was about the shroud and how it was in camp, you know, in, in, in closed in this, like you say, um, kind of bulletproof uh, covering and everything like they're supposed to be keeping it in and how they breached that and got that that cloth off and took the blood and actually cloned it that it's a fascinating movie and anybody that is interested in in that kind of thing and, and especially about some of the research that i've done they're pretty spot on with the way that they show how that is kept and how important it is to catholicism that it cannot be gotten into so i thought the movie was quite quite good and it, and it leaves you a little bit like if you saw the Omen movies that I saw when I was a young girl uh, coming yeah. up through school, it, it leaves you with that same impression that that Jesus has been cloned. But it's What's the name it's of that movie. It's called The Devil Conspiracy. And Where I saw it, it now. I saw it about a month, I believe, a little over a month ago. It was actually in the movie theater here really? in my town. And I would have never, like I say, I, I would have thought it was some kind of Halloween movie and, and things like that. And I usually don't take time to go to the movie. But I did have somebody, I think it was in Idaho, a Facebook friend, who sent and said, do you know about this movie? I think it has a lot to do with your research. And when I went to see it, I was like, oh, my gosh, did they read my, wow. <laughs> did they read my research? Maybe they did. <laughs> yeah. Because it was a lot about what is very real and as far as the blood and the cloning of it and the and all that's been done uh on on the shroud itself so it's uh quite something if you can find it it is called the devil conspiracy and i would encourage people to uh to actually go in and see it or if they can find it i'm sure it probably will come out on some of these other movie sites that are available for you know movies that make it through the the show times and things that like you know cinemas and then go on uh, TV and YouTube and things of that nature, but it does really talk about it. And it, and it really quite is interesting, the concept that they use and, and what they use to make it happen. I mean, even though it's fictitious, there's an element of truth in it, uh, much like you see in the Da Vinci Code, there's an element of truth in it uh, and demons and dragons and angels and things of that nature. There, there's some There's some truth in it. But you just have to know where to look for those kinds of things. And and this movie really does bring to the table a little bit uh, about how the possibility is very real. You know, and, it's interesting. You, you mentioned movies. And in the green room before the show started, um, you and I briefly talked about uh, The Passion. He's yes. making a sequel to that called The Resurrection. That that will be interesting, you know. Yeah, I wonder if at the very beginning of that they will have the the shroud in that, and maybe talk a little bit about that or or reference to that. It'll be interesting. Well, you know, the thing about it is, uh, uh, the Left Behind series just came out with one called Antichrist Rising, and I went to see that the other day as well, and it picked up kind of where the other Left Behind series was involved in it. But you know, they're they're bringing these things back, and another thing that's touring right now is the Jesus Christ Superstar Opera. And interesting enough, at the end of that, they drop a cloth down and it is a complete huge Jesus. Wow. On the, it's like a Strato Turin. So it's, it's pretty amazing. So there's there's a lot of talk in regard to all this because a lot of are they people... Still, nowadays, are they still all naked in that show? <laughs> no, no, they're not. Remember actually, back in the day, I think that was the show, or was it another one? Am I thinking of another play that had something it, to do with Jesus, and they were all? Uh, I think that was one that they came out with, and I can't think of the name of it, but it caused a lot of controversy about it. But I actually saw um, the off Broadway the first time I saw Jesus Christ Superstar off Broadway play was in Washington D.C., and that was amazing to me. I never dreamed that at the end of the show that they would drop a. I mean, it was a full length thing all the way down at the very end. And it just gave you chill bumps because it was like if you did not know what the Shroud of Turin looked like, it was like larger than life. And so I'm scheduled to go back down to see it. It's touring again. It's its 50th anniversary. And so 
tells how old I am because I was singing the, those songs about that a long time ago when I was in high school. So it tells me how old I am. But I'm, I'm scheduled to go see that again uh, with a really good friend and, um, and thankful for the opportunity to be able to see if they're still going to drop that at the very end with that, uh, that, that shroud. Because I think that, if anything, what we're going to see is how uh, the Messiah that the world is going to claim as Messiah will fall in line a lot with Satan, planet Earth. And that's the real push right now ecologically. So uh, that's why I felt like we really needed to get a real good grip on how the shroud and the image on the shroud could play out as an image of the beast that's talked about and why Jesus might have been saying to be very careful that when people start saying this is me, that you are aware that when he said this image is going to be walking in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And like I mentioned on your show one time before, when he was talking, he was talking about his body being the temple. And many people forget that he called his body the temple because he told the Pharisees and Sadducees, I'm going to raise this up in three days. And they were like, oh, it took us 40 years to build that. There's no way you can do that. He was talking about his body. So I think it's pretty interesting when the and when uh, scripture says he's walking in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And, and, you know, the abomination of desolation, when you think about how terrible that is, I can't think of anything any worse than Satan walking around in Jesus's body because it would be an empty shell. If you look at identical twins, there is a difference between the fingerprints and the irises. But if you clone yourself, it's an identical you. So there's a little bit of di difference between a true clone and an identical twin. So we're talking about taking the flesh and making something that would be absolutely no spirit body and, and no soul walking within it. I know a lot of people get anxious about stuff like that, but it is a true science. Cloning is a true science. And probably in one of the shows later on, we'll get into cloning and what, what that's involved with because I look at it from the scientific narrative and not some conspiracy kind of thing, just like with the Shroud of Turin. I'm looking at this in the scientific narrative and how it lines up with scripture. So, you know, when I saw this, this uh, image there in Newsweek when I was young, of course, it solidified everything that I knew that I had dreamed about. And at the same time, I was already starting to do papers, write poetry and things of that nature in regard to the end of days. And interesting enough, while I was in, in school there, uh, I was working on my, um, actually my four year, finishing up my four year degree and working on my master's at the same time. And I asked a professor if I could do my thesis on uh, light, the alpha and the mega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last. And it was really in regard to knowing that whatever happened on that shroud absolutely left that image using some form of pure energy that we have not been able to identify. Mm -hmm. And so that was what started me on my quest to understand about the end of days. And so the shroud played a very important uh, role in that. So if you look at the shroud of Turin, what you actually see is a rectangular linen cloth. And this is one thing I want everybody to always remember. The Jewish people never mixed anything they considered mixing something together to be abomination so they didn't make uh, anything that was linen with cotton in it or something that was wool with linen in it if it was totally a cloth it would be linen if it was another piece of cloth it would be wool if it would be another piece of cloth it would be cotton and this is important and i'll, and I'll share with that about that if we get through it today if not then i'll be bringing up why it's important that the Jewish people never believed in mixing anything. And, and if anything, you can go back, and this goes back to the Garden of Eden. Everything was good after its kind. The first thing that was not good after its kind was the tree of knowledge of good and evil because there was two things mixed in one root of a tree. So mixing is an abomination. And that is why it's important to note right here, that that Shroud of Turin was created as a rectangular linen cloth actually comprised of flax. It measured 14.6 feet long and it was 3.5 feet wide. So clearly 
long enough for you to lay it down on a slab in a tomb, put Jesus on top of it, and then roll it over him. It would have covered his entire body, front and back, just like the Shroud of Turin does, and shows us on the shroud not only the frontal image, but also his back image. So that is there. The shroud is definitely, like I showed you in the picture, a faint yellow image. And on that image, you can clearly see when you do a negative of it. And that's what was so fascinating. When they were doing the research, they did a reverse image. And all of a sudden, the image pops out really very, very clear. On that image is a bearded man who clearly has been crucified with blood stains that match the wounds identical. Let me say that again. Identical to the wounds that we know through scripture that Jesus suffered. And that is recorded in all four gospels. So this is not something conspiracy. And I remember one time I had started to church at a new little church and somebody asked about my work and I made a comment uh, on Facebook about the Shroud of Turin and literally had a preacher at like, oh, that's just like out there in left field and whatever. And immediately yeah, it was a great concern to my, for me for somebody like that to make a comment when I knew the truth about this cloth and the research behind it. Uh, I think over time, he finally realized that maybe he should not have made that comment, but he never came back and really apologized about it. But it was clear to me he had not done the research. And so when somebody comes up or knocks me about this research, I'm like immediately it rolls off my back because the thing is, they have not done the research. If you do the research on this, it shows you exactly what scripture is saying. Sometimes people will say, oh, well, that's not scriptural or that's not a part of what is in the, in, in the Bible. Oh, yes, it is. And this is the thing is that it is mentioned in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Since 1578, the shroud has been in Turin, Italy, where it is located now. And this is in a place there in Turin called the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. And these are things that if you want to go and Google these, that you can go and Google this and see more about what I'm talking about. If you're interested in knowing more about this, I encourage you to do that. How, um, I, I, how, what was the, <clears throat> excuse me for interrupting again. There okay. was before it went to Turin, if I'm not mistaken, some nuns had it. Well, see, the nuns actually were there when the cloth, it, the, the cathedral caught fire. And when it caught fire, they were able to get the cloth itself was kind of kept in like a silver kind of case. And there was water damage and where it kind of got singed because they got it out of, they saved it. And what those nuns did is they reworked the outer edges of the shroud with cotton. They didn't use linen, they used cotton. And so they were able to save the cloth. But the cloth itself, before it became the property of the, the uh, Catholic Church and, and bequeathed to the Pope at the time, it was owned by Umberto, King Umberto of Italy. And he actually got it from the Charney family, who was a part of the Knights Templar. And no doubt that he was a part of the Knights Templar. And that is why he was able to get this particular shroud and actually own it. And at his death, it was actually bequeathed to um, the Pope. And so since that time, the Pope has really been the overseer of, of the Shroud of Turin. But it has been housed in Turin, Italy at this cathedral of St. John the Baptist. And we're talking about 1578. So it's been there a very, very long time. And, it, and like you say, there were times in the past when they would bring the cloth out and they would parade it and they would let people see it. But they always had like that extra, you know, don't let anybody kind of get near it kind of thing. So the fact that um, 
it was paraded and shown like that. There's just no doubt in my mind that those people, even at that time, were pretty sure they that that was the had. burial cloth of Jesus. They knew what they had. I mean, That's right. nobody has ever, sure, there's many skeptics, but every extremely powerful, well-known, respected religious figure, hundreds of, going back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, all believe it. it's the it's the burial cloth of Christ. Uh, no one's ever said it's not. Even to this day, the Pope says, no one says it's not. Some right. might not say for sure it is, but right. you can see in the look in their eye, they wouldn't be taking the kind of care of Precaution. It. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the the I mean the jet aircraft engines kind of thing that they've got the thing put in or whatever. I mean, it, it's like a it's like a major thing that is far exceeding of any relic in history that's being done like that. And uh, I know when Pope Francis took over as Pope, one of the first things that he said right after that was that he believed that that cloth was actually real, that it was authentic. And in let's, every let's pope before just, that, let's just say for 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 argument's sake, I, I'm on I'm a 110 percent over the top believer that it's the image yes. of Christ. Let's just for for argument's sake say it's not Christ. Well, we know this: most people that were crucified back back then in Christ's time were once they were taken down off the cross, they were drug, you know, uh, and thrown into that mass grave Gehenna. They weren't treated like that. It was somebody who was of some significant importance, even though he was crucified, of some significant importance to be to have be buried like that by that wealthy gentleman that had his own family tomb that That's he right. offered it up for Christ That's to right. bury him in that type of burial cloth, That's regardless right. of who it was. Somebody of an extreme so that that's 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 what I struggle with. So if he was so that's so important, it's just yes. a shame that you had the people in power. They knew it too, and that's why, in my humble opinion, and I I don't know anything, but in my humble opinion, that's why they crucified him because exactly. they, they knew they knew they knew, and they wanted him to be you know the Sadducees, Pharisees, the Sinees, those kind of guys. The, the the people wanted to take uh, the kingdoms away from the Romans. And when Jesus said, love your neighbor and do all this other stuff, it, it went against their desire to conquer. And so, yes, there's no doubt in my mind that they knew that they were crucifying him because he was not living up to their expectations. And he was asking them to do something that was totally a opposite. And, you know, he even said to the Pharisees and Sadducees, you don't know me because you're of your father, the devil, because if you had known my father, you would know who I am. But that, by that time, they had started mixing all of their mosaic law with the Talmud and, and mixing the Babylonian teachings and doctrines of men together to the point that they were not even aware of who Jesus Christ really was. And then when they felt like he was that, they you know wanted to get rid of him. And um, unfortunately, we know that that was the best thing they could have done because him going to the cross is what gives us the opportunity to use his blood to cover us and, and allows us, you know, the, the salvation and to be able to to get into heaven because he becomes our our kind of lawyer. In other words, his blood is what covers all of our sins. And if we didn't have that and if you don't choose him, you don't have him standing on your behalf on, on judgment day at all. And, um, and the blood was, was crucial to, for him to go to the cross and to die. So I think that, um, you know, the fact that Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, you know, he's mentioned in scripture going to uh, Pontius Pilate and asking yeah. for the body of Jesus. And like you say, he was a very wealthy man. And no doubt that the reason that this herringbone linen cloth that that has survived now for over 2000 years there in the Vatican, that was a fine piece of cloth that Jesus was wrapped in because, you know, Joseph Arimathea was was of uh, uh, Arimathea was not a uh, poor man. He was a very wealthy man. And like we know that his his tomb was actually where Jesus was placed. So, you know, if you go back, a lot of people ask, you know, well, what does it mean when it talks about that, you know, that 
Christ was wrapped in like strips of linen or linen cloths. And sometimes they, they'll say, well, that's a proof maybe that the uh, cloth is not real. But, you know, I went back and really looked at this and I found out that the words, as according to the biblical translations, the word strips of cloth or cloths, they, they use strips of cloth, cloths, and then cloth. They're all used. So when you look at that and you look at how they did what they did, there, there are some of the research that says that there were strips that were used like to bind the chin and the, in the wrist and the feet. But the thing is that since Joseph of Arimathea would have needed strips of cloth to actually bind that body to that 14 foot barrel cloth, you, you kind of see that maybe there could have been some strips like that. But the biggest thing is, is something called the, um, the cloth that is over in Avia, Spain, which is called, it's actually the Sidarian cloth. And it was a facial napkin that was really put over the face. And it has been in Ovita, Spain since 500 AD. And that blood on that cloth is identical to the blood that's on the shroud. And interesting enough where the blood is for the face on the shroud, on that napkin, it's exactly the identical place. So when people say this cloth was something that was painted, in the Middle Ages, well, it could not have been yeah. because you've got a face napkin with exactly the same blood matching the exact same spots on the face that has never been anywhere but there in Ovita, Spain. It's not been have, taken. It have they been done any tests like that on the veil, the one that uh, the woman put on Jesus's face during <laughs> um, the crucifixion? See, I don't know enough about that. I just know that when I saw the movie, The Passion of the Christ, and they did Veronica's Veil where he fell and she went over and wiped his face. I don't know very much about that particular cloth that, that was there. But, you know, uh, the fact that Mel Gibson used that in uh, his movie makes me believe that there's some trueness about something like that maybe happened in that cloth existing as it was. But well, the, they, face... they, the Vatican admits they have it, They just, but they just don't, they don't, again, it's been, oh my gosh, 20, 30 years since they've ever sh shown it to anyone, but they claim to have it. Well, the thing about it is, is that all of this stuff is very important. And they are trying to keep it from anybody ever getting their hands on it to be able yeah. to do anything with it. It's that crucial because you're talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. You're not talking about a human being like you and I. We're talking about the son of God. And of course, the, the research that I did on what Ron Wyatt says he found is an archaeologist. And he says he found the Ark of the Covenant there under the uh, grotto that actually below where Jesus was crucified up there on Calvary, that when the earthquake happened, that the blood ran down and fell into Jeremiah's grotto and fell on that mercy seat. And he supposedly got some of the blood from that and said that there were only like 23 chromosomes for the female, but there was only one for the male. And I will, I will note this, that even all the research that was done on the, 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 um, cloth over there in Avita, Spain. And then on the shroud, it was noted that it was an, uh, a very rare form of AB blood. But I find it interesting that they said very rare form so that we haven't really been told exactly what that blood type may be and why they called it rare, a very rare form of that. I find that very interesting that that was talked about. And then the fact that Ron White said that he was able to get some of that blood that reconstituted it he took it down to some Israeli scientists there. He did not tell them where he had gotten that blood from. And he asked them to spin it. And when he spun, at first they said it was dead. There was nothing they could do to it. And he said, no, just, just spin the blood like you would normally spin the blood. And when they did, it was alive. And then they, when he came back, then they were like, you know, they knew what had happened. And I think that, that you know, they knew that that shroud was probably there in Jeremiah's grotto and had been kept secret. And uh, when he went back, it had been moved. But the thing about it is he was able to determine that there was 23 chromosomes for a male and uh, I mean, for a female and none but one for a male. So, you know, when you have chromosomes, you're supposed to get 23 from your mother and 23 from your father. 
and there, and that blood that he took, those Israeli scientists said 23 chromosomes for the mother, but only one for the father, which mm -hmm. would make that a divine being. And, and so if that's the case, when they say it's a very rare form of AB blood, <laughs> it yeah. might be because it's only got like 23 chromosomes or this and only one for that. So I don't think we will uh, be able to know that for sure until it's time for this cloth to be revealed. It's totally authentic. And that's why it's so important for us to understand about it, because it's going to come to a day when this cloth is going to be told to the world that it is the burial cloth of Jesus Christ and that the research is proving that this and this and this has been taken from it. And it will probably be used to glorify and prove that the man walking among us is in fact the Messiah. So this is why this, this information is ab absolutely so important. So, you know, the, the burial customs that were going on back then with these cloths like this was very important. And I think that's the thing for us to look at is that since the four gospels themselves stated that, you know, Joseph of Ormathea owned that cloth that was used to wrap Jesus and that the, the gospels in your, in your hum humble opinion, um, there's no, no person better to ask for their humble opinion than you. In, in, if you had to make the best guest of your guess of your life, who do you think would actually think to grab after, you know, um, Mary shows up to the tomb, stone's been moved, the mm -hmm. soldiers are there and they, they talk about something miraculous happening in the middle of the night. Um, they go in there, Jesus's body is gone and the shroud is there. Who do you think thought to, to gather it up and save it? Well, you know, I find it interesting, you know, in John, it talks about that, you know, when Simon Peter came and went into the tomb, it, it clearly says that he saw the linen cloths actually lying there. And it says, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. That's John 20, 6 and 7. Again, it says, Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He was following, you know, because they went running after um, Mary Magdalene and told him what was going on. It says he saw the linen cloths, C-L-O-T-H-S, cloths, lying there. And the handkerchief had been around his head and it was not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. So that's a very interesting thing that we've got his burial wrap that was around him and you know, laying there. And then that face napkin that's been in Avita, Spain since 500 A.D., that matches that cloth perfectly was laying there. So we, we know that Simon Peter was very aware of it and that John in, in his, in his uh, gospel wrote it, John 20, six and seven. If you want to go look at that uh, particular scripture, there was definitely those cloths there. So there's no question that Jesus had been wrapped in those cloths. You know, the fact that we're not told that what was on those cloths, but you would know that if he was crucified yeah. like he was crucified and you put a cloth on somebody crucified, there would have been blood everywhere on that cloth. And if anybody just go and look at the negatives of that image online and you can clearly see that man is covered in blood and it's from a person who was crucified. I mean, it is amazing how true to to exactly what the scriptures say from the cat of nine tails that hit his back and dug into his flesh because like a, it's like a cat grabbing you and pulling back you can literally see where the flesh is pulled off of that man i mean it is it's horrific when you really yeah. gaze at it um and, and it really is proven that so once you look at the sidereum what's called the sidereum cloth of avita spain that is, when you say Sidereian cloth, the interpretation of that is the handkerchief or napkin that is believed to have covered the face of Jesus. 
And you can go online and look at that as well, because it is amazing what that looks like. So have you ever real quick? And this is a little off topic. I'm sorry I can interrupt. That's you. OK. Imagine bringing Christ down off of the cross. I, you know, they wouldn't wrap him up without first removing that crown of thorns. You would think somebody would. I don't know. Do you, do you do you feel somebody would think this is something we don't want to save or something that's that's disrespectful to Christ and let's throw it away? Or do you think someone has saved that? And have you ever heard of anything in your studies and your travels about the crown of thorns? Well, you know, the thing about it is on the cloth itself, the people who did like um, uh, forensic evidence, they did find that on that shroud that there were these pollinated things in the head area. And when they went back and looked at what that was from, there is a thorny bush that only grows in Jerusalem that produces thorns like that that could have been fixed and pushed down on his head. And I have that, an authentic crown of thorns made in Israel that I had shipped to me and it hangs around the head and shoulders of a huge crucifix and corpus I have in my hallway and of course you know me when I first got it I gently tried to put it on oh my uh, gosh so painful yeah um, it, and it is and so you know they cramped they pushed it down his head and some believe that maybe it even had a covering on it in other words it was like a cap that was just pushed down on his head no, that this particular bush that grows and it's interesting it only grows in jerusalem that produces this this thing that could have made a crown like that yeah and the fact that it's there and the fact that that pollen was on that area where jesus's head is on that shroud of turin i mean what are the odds of that you couldn't have had that cloth somewhere and painted it and then gone to jerusalem and got pollen and carried it back and put it on the, the shroud. I mean, the person trying to do that in the Middle Ages, it wouldn't have been possible for that to have happened. And then the fact that this Sidarian of Avita Spain is so, you know, the evidence is there that it's a smaller piece of linen. We're still looking at linen cloths. Joseph of Arimathea was wealthy. So the Shroud of Turin was a linen cloth. The, the, the face napkin that was put over his face that's there at Avita Spain is definitely another piece of linen cloth and it measures 34 by 21 inches. And if that's the case, then if you look at the Gospel of John, it specifically says this cloth was around his head. So if it was there, you know, because he was dead, you know, they did it out of respect. Anybody that's seen a dead person, I mean, you you really don't want to like look at them because it's a scary kind of thing. Yeah. You kind of, you know, we close the eyes and we kind of cover them up. You know, we pull the sheet over them and things of that nature when somebody's passed away. So you can understand out of respect for the dead that that cloth was really placed on Jesus's face immediately Wait, after well, his crucifixion and probably yeah, you, before he was actually wrapped in the shroud. You think about these people that are handling his body, true believers, true followers, um, having gone through that and witnessed that. Now, you, you talk about the the eclipse and the earthquake that happened right when he finally passed on the mm -hmm. cross. So they're going to take these people handling his body are going to take extra special care because they're talking about they don't know if he's going to rise from the dead or not. And right. even if he doesn't, they're still going to. Treat respect his him. body with extreme reverence and yes. be careful with it and that's what that that's what that burial cloth is that, that that it's just screaming to us that that's what happened well and and like i say the the fact that this 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 napkin is even mentioned you know there it's it's mentioned in scripture it's not like some fake kind of thing and so when you look at there's only a couple of key differences between the sidarian cloth there in Spain and the shroud that's being housed in Turin, Italy, is that the only thing that, that the Sidarian does, it doesn't show the image of a man's face going through it. So we know that it was there, but it was stained with the blood. It's got the same human secretions that you typically will suffer if you've had any kind of thing when your body's under that kind of trauma. 
you will give off certain things as far as sweat glands and things of that nature that shows that you're traumatized. And so forensic science has looked at that and said these facial wounds and the forensic evidence of what was on the shroud in that blood tells you that it was highly, highly uh, from a person that was traumatized beyond words. And so to me, you have to look at it that it's a companion to the shroud. And if you look at what the scientists are saying, everybody that's done the research on it, it all it matches. The two cloths match from the herringbone linen. It matches the fact that it has the blood stains. The blood stains are supposed to be identical in the places where the shroud was put on him. The same places are on that 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 napkin. And we know Jesus apparently res resurrected through that that shroud and apparently that cloth had been pulled off of his face it was actually folded in a different place so i think that the fact that even them saying that it was a rare type of ab there's been a lot of research and, and you know this as well as i do the public is not you know once once this shroud is proven to be real what happens to the other religions sean it totally destroys the other religions when you realize that Jesus Christ is not dead, that this cloth is literally proving he is alive. It's not something that's been falsely painted or made to look like anything. It is the real deal. And so you've got not only the forensic science on the shroud, you've got forensic science on this napkin that matches and it, and, it, and it core. I mean, it correlates to the point that you can't say it's just a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. And scripture tells us it was there. Now, uh, I feel like that probably because we're getting to the end of the show that we'll pick up and just see Absolutely. how how the timeline of the shroud began from the moment this is in the tomb and and the Perfect. disciples are aware of it. And we know it's there per scripture. We're going to look at what and how that cl that cloth got where it got and then how it moved through history to get where it is today, because that is significant. People back in the day were said that when they looked at this cloth, that they were healed. So there was some miraculousness about it, that it was kept hidden. And it's that it energy that you talked about briefly that yes. made the imprint um, that is giving the people the healing. But before we go into any further and get cut off, this is a wonderful place for us to mark it on your, on your notes there. Let's pick right yes, up we will. where we left off tonight. I love you. I respect you. This was a great, great episode. I can't wait for next month. And um, I want you to have a great remainder of your Monday evening hugs and kisses. And I will, I talk to you a lot between shows, but sure. I will see you next, uh, the second Monday of next month. That sounds great. And so everybody, if you want to follow this, we was always, if you didn't see next or when next month comes up and you didn't see this show, come back and look at this show again. So you can pick up and, and be able to follow right with us next, next month. I love you. I'll see you later. I love you too. Good night. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, that was great. I, this is a great topic. And um, I want her to take her time and take as many episodes as she needs to cover this one. My bishop, Bishop James Long, loves that topic, too. And I think in my seminary studies, we're going to do in a, a class on the Shroud, too. So that's going to be very, very cool. Um, so, yeah, second Monday of every month. Dr. Joy will be here. It's the Joy to the World monthly lecture series with her. So the second Monday of every month for the rest of this year and as long as um, I, she'll keep coming back. Uh, I will be here this coming Friday with a brand new show, the 17th. Literally, I'll be here because the special guest is me. <laughs> I may have a surprise guest come on, but I decided to do a show by myself. 
in a one-on-one -on -one with you guys. My mailbag's overflowing. My prayer urn is overflowing. I hardly ever pay attention to the chat room, so that's going to be my main priority for you guys to come on, Q&A with me, ask me anything you want in the chat room, and I'll address it, and we'll have fun this, this coming Friday the 17th. All right. Thank you to Zach and Adrian Clayton, my co-producers. CommunityPayItForward.us. CommunityPayItForward.us. Go there, find somebody that needs some help with something, and if you can help them, help them. My church, not my church, but the church I belong to, USOCC.org. Go there, check it out. If you're interested in Bible study, which is Monday through Friday, every night at 7 p.m. Pacific, uh, I'm sorry, night prayer, Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Pacific, or Bible study Wednesday and Sunday afternoons at 5 p.m. Pacific, go to bishopjameslong.com. Scroll down to the bottom of the home page. The link to both of those are there. Thank you to Things Network. Thank you to Temple of Phoenix Rising Entertainment. Thank you to Skeleton Key Network. Thank you to PACT, Little P, capital A-C-T, podcasting for all coming together channel. And BeInspiredRadio.net re-airs of this show all day Saturdays on BeInspiredRadio.net. Okay, guys, I love you all. Thank you all so much for being here. I don't have a show without you. I hope you guys had as much fun as I did. Uh, can't wait for her return episode next month. On that note, good night, Danny. Good night, Jack. Good night, Dog. Good night, Harold. Rest in peace. Good night, Ernie. Good night, Bill. Good night, Dan. God bless you all. I love you all. Peace.